Hello everyone, my name is Peter Harrop, I'm chairman of ID TechX and I've got the privilege of interviewing BYD today and uh, perhaps you could explain your position, sure. Michael. Sure, my name is Michael Austin. I am the vice president of BYD America, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of BYD Corporate. I've been involved with almost every aspect of launching BYD in the United States, um, mostly involved in promoting products that they already developed in China and using that giant consumer leverage that's going on there to access products that would make sense in the US. So we have containers of batteries that are energy storage stations that have inverter, bi-directional inverters and storage to do microgrids and frequency reg. We've had a very good business of that. We have, uh, we now opened up two factories in the US. Uh, we were the first Chinese vendor to of the first Chinese vehicle manufacturer to dare put their feet on American soil. In California, we launched an electric bus manufacturing site. And Lancaster is Lancaster, that, is yeah. Okay. Lancaster. So it's the northern part of LA County. And we now have a thousand Americans designing, manufacturing American made buses from, mm. and I think it's 79% American material. So the mm. parts that we do import are the raw cells from, uh, and anyone would have to mm. import materials from China if it's cathode or anode, but we import that. We manufacture modules in, the, in Lancaster as well in a separate mm. factory. Mm. It's an American company called BYD Energy. Ah. And I use those batteries for selling to the, bu the coach and bus team, mm. but I also use those battery modules for for any kind of energy storage in the US. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. But it's all been grid storage to date. Hasn't been uh, yeah, smaller okay, systems yet. Okay. That's very interesting. From the point of view of ID TechX, we are um, looking very independently at things, and we've always felt that there is um, a great link between um, microgrids, mini grids, off grid. Uh, and uh, distributed power and the electric vehicle in a way, an electric bus, an electric truck is a microgrid. And um, it was interesting to see how um, Tesla did uh, merge with its um, sister business of um, solar, solar panels, but, uh, and that is uh, not initially for vehicles at all. Um, but we did feel we had to write about how BYD uh, if I have it correct, you were already in solar and you also even, I think, do some wind turbines? So we, we do, we've done all types of renewables and our vision is really to start with low cost renewable, hmm. make it relevant, make it firm and dispatchable to the grid with environmentally friendly storage, hmm. distributed storage on the hmm. grid, and then deliver it responsibly to electric vehicles or LED lighting systems and buildings. And that ecosystem is we, what we call the zero emission ecosystem. Mm. You start with renewables, you make it relevant to the grid, you deliver it to vehicles, mm. and that system of products is what we've been focused on developing. In the US, we're focused on high utility vehicles. Mm. So anything that has 18 hour service every day, warehousing operations, forklifts, right, right. Uh, airport operations, tugs, you know, mm. like LAX mm. where they're operating, mm. Uh, mm. They're, they're actually going to be testing some of our product. Mm. Uh, waste management, even mm. that run all the time picking mm. up garbage. We, we feel like that's a great application. Street sweepers, mm. Mm. drayage vehicles moving from the port. So the ports are in operation 24 hours a day. Yeah, yeah. Those off-road applications yes. generate a lot of pollution. Yes, yes. Because they're, they're consuming diesel fuel and burning diesel fuel 24 hours a day. We feel like if we focus on those mm. high utility applications, we have the biggest payback because mm. it's offsetting the fuel cost and maintenance mm. costs, mm. but environmentally, it's a huge win. So tell me about um, energy storage. Um, Tesla's done great things. We greatly admire Tesla, but um, Panasonic is really their battery technology. Is your battery technology your own or what? So it is, it is. And um, you know, I, I worked at Motorola 15 years I bought Panasonic batteries. The NCA chemistry is a great chemistry. Very high energy density, and I would say it was commoditized years ago. The 18650 cylindrical cell mm. that Tesla launched in their Roadster and used in the uh, Tesla S, very commoditized. That's why they selected it. They wanted a very low cost platform to launch. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, 
the chemistry was already very mature. There wasn't a whole lot of energy density improvements occurring, and material improvements had already occurred. So the, there was a plateauing that I think Elon ex felt mm -hmm. with the pricing. The only way to get beyond that was an equity investment. So what did he do? He did a capital lease on the Panasonic equipment mm -hmm. and built a factory in Sparks, Nevada. Now it's still a Panasonic gigafactory. Mm -hmm. It's Panasonic engineers. It's mm -hmm. Panasonic yeah, yeah, absolutely. lease equipment. And yes. it's a great chemistry. Yeah. And he's done a great job integrating that chemistry in with his other integrated components mm -hmm. and a beautiful design in the Tesla mm -hmm. S Model 3 and now having success, right? Okay. Um, but you asked about energy storage, so... Well, generally, could I ask one, move one thing forward on sure that? Sure you may, uh, yeah, I'm sure. interrupting rudely, but... No. You mentioned drayage trucks, you mentioned buses, and um, in China, both of those, there are examples of them running on supercapacitors, not batteries at all. Sure. And that's fairly standard for automatic guided vehicles and uh, new developments in supercapacitors. Um, seem to promise some rivalry with lithium-ion batteries. What's the view of BYD? So on, a, on a, a vehicle that operates 365 days, super capacitors, especially if it's in route daily charging, mm. super capacitors don't store energy very long. They're, they're, dis no, right. they're immediately dissipating energy from the minute you charge them. Yes. So the vehicle has to consume their energy immediately. Mm. Super capacitors are great if the vehicle is in operation immediately after it's charged, but you can't let it sit no. over the weekend. Yeah. It won't have energy when, yeah. it, when you yeah. ride back. So there's a combination super capacitor chemistry, the lithium titanate, right? Mm. It, it has a similar fast charge capability, a propensity to hold enough storage for 24 hour service, but what people have found is that supercapacitors and lithium titanate are extremely expensive. And when you size it so that it can at least do a 30 mile range, then you're adding infrastructure. And if you're doing a 500 kilowatt or a 600 kilowatt mm. power transfer, like Tesla does, yes. that's, that's a, could be upwards of a half a million dollars per site mm. to do that 600 kilowatt charge during the peak hours. So mm. you might have some off peak charging, but you also have on peak. At any time you do that on the grid, you have demand yes. charges yeah. that you now have to navigate, which can be 80% of your electric bill. Mm. So what we've tried to avoid is peak time charging. Yeah. If you create a vehicle, like a drayage vehicle, with enough battery to run 24 hours, but then charge off peak, or charge when the rates are the lowest, or charge when the utility feels like they need to, mm. to get rid of some excess energy, mm. If you create a system like that, then that flexibility allows you to access the lowest cost okay. energy so, and the lowest impact of the grid. Yes, right. Um, but there might be advances. Do you make oh, supercapacitors? Are you working on supercapacitors? So, so BYD uh, manufactures a whole bunch of different chemistries. Yeah. We manufacture for vehicles, we manufacture nickel, manganese, cobalt. Now that's batteries. That's batteries. Mm. And we manufacture iron phosphate batteries. And we manufacture 1.5 million battery packs a day for of lithium cobalt oxide, which is again. And then mm. in the supercapacitors and the other, we have research development because we do a lot of informatics for vehicles. There's a lot of capacitor technologies to balance high, yeah, rate, so high rate transmission. Yeah, you're an advanced user, but not a maker necessarily. Well, yeah. we have some. Yeah. We have some advances. We haven't done it mm. for mm. vehicle. Yeah. Okay, well, moving on, uh, sure. do you do your own power electronics? Are you in the world of silicon carbide, gallium nitride? Have you got an attitude to gallium oxide? <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is yes. Uh, we have a six inch wafer fab in Ningbo, and we make all our power MOSFETs. We make our own IGBTs for the vehicles. Those IGBTs become bi directional inverters, so we use in all of our vehicles. And the unique thing about all of BYD's vehicles is that we deliver direct AC to the bus, to the truck. We, we don't have a charge cabinet that converts to DC that's separate from the vehicle. We yeah. made the investment, we made the investment because yeah. we have asynchronous in wheel hub motors. We need to take regenerative braking and convert it anyway yeah. by making it so that we added a little, probably a little larger mm. bi-directional inverter in the vehicles. We've enabled now that vehicle to generate power. So 
many of our vehicles will have a button that says discharge. And when you press that, it energizes the port mm. that was the AC 480 volt three phase port mm. so that you can now remotely power something. You can power a building, you can power, you can charge another vehicle, vehicle to vehicle assist. So the approach BYD took was let's, let's bear a little more cost by directional inverters. It didn't end, actually end up being more because we threw up, threw up the scale. It reduced infrastructure costs because every Tesla supercharger has a 40 volt three phase connection. We just need to adapt our connector. Yeah. So everywhere that Tesla has a supercharger, we have access to AC. Mm. So supercharging for BYD just means accessing high rate AC. Okay. And that standard is already in place mm. across the whole United States, across the UK, mm. and across Europe, across China. So mm. high rate charging for us is extremely simple. Right. Whereas our competitors have always put one more stack, one more middleman. And you actually showed it on some of your slides that those were going away. Mm. The middlemen were going away. We yeah. agree with that. And, and having the vehicle generate or convert its own power right. Right. Is, is the next so, step in the so, evolution. Uh, as you said, um, it, your electric powertrain is agnostic. It can work with uh, regenerative suspension. Are you in, uh, is that something you're bringing in perhaps? So I believe that the technology that we're focused on right now is increasing the high rate efficiency in wheel hub motors. So we have asynchronous, asynchronous motors. In wheel, you're in, near wheel. At, in wheel. At the moment, um, you're near wheel. No, Is they're that... in wheel. The buses are all in wheel ah, hub right. motors. Okay. And so what's great about that, think about this. When you're transporting lots of people, you're always concerned about loading times, right? And on a standard diesel bus, you got four steps up till you mm. get to the driver and you have to stick the fare in, right? Mm. We're now delivering buses that have a nine inch step and it's flat floor throughout because if you remove the axle, you remove that drivetrain, you, you have move the clutch freedom. Yeah. You have freedom to put the aisle below the axle Carry height. more people even, yes. So it's, mm. it's disabled friendly, it's elderly friendly loading, it is by far the easiest. Mm. We delivered bus, a bus to Indianapolis. We have 60 foot articulated buses that carry 120 passengers. The doors that, or the buses in, um, at Indianapolis have the buses have five doors. They don't have a fare box. Everyone that gets to the platform already is paid with their mobile gotcha. phone. When the yeah. doors open, it's instantaneous load. Yeah. In one minute, you've loaded 120 passengers. Very efficient. Yeah. Extremely efficient, and it's on a platform. They don't even mm. step up. Mm. The buses have side wheels that actually align it. Mm. They step, there's an inch gap. The platform is the same height as the floor, and it's flat floor and throughout. And you make your own motors, and are, what type of motor are they? So they're asynchronous, and they're, they're all, um, we use, we use, um, in China, we have, uh, they're all, they're all uh, rare earth metal permanent magnet mo motors. Uh, the asynchronous is no permanent magnet. What's that? Asynchronous would be no permanent magnet. Surely. No, they're, they're, they're using, they're so using be, a permanent magnet, a, a very a rare then, earth metal. And yeah. it's, it's a very efficient motor. Yeah. They're, but they're, they're independent wheel hub motors for the yeah. buses. Yeah. We've adopted them in several of the vehicles. Mm. We don't have a consumer vehicle today that yeah. is an in-wheel hub. No. Um, they're all still drivetrain because yeah. we, we could use the same to go all-wheel yeah. drive. In fact, yeah. all of the vehicles that we've launched this year uh, follow a 542 initiative. Yeah. Five, meaning it drives under five seconds from zero to 100 kilometers per hour. Right, right. So that's the first. The second is four, which is all-wheel drive. All-wheel drive, uh, they're all motor-driven, yeah. all wheels are motor-driven, and then two, that it would consume, if it's a hybrid, it would consume less than two liters for every 100 kilometers traveled. Gotcha, yeah. So that standard, our engineering standard 542, uh, has allowed us to, to really drive traction control and all wheels, the performance is really increased. A lot of people vehicles. are moving towards solar bodywork. Tesla said it's going to adopt it. So uh, Toyota says it's pursuing it. Um, it's being brought out by Sono Motors and Lightyear next year and Hanergy the year after. And we've heard about Hyundai moving in that direction. What's your attitude to that? Well, the very first mass production plug-in hybrid ever launched. Three years before the Volt, three years before the plug-in Prius, had a solar panel on top of it. Mm. It was the F3 DM from yep. BYD. But solar bodywork. I know, um, but yeah, this was yeah. this was 
in roof solar. Yeah, beginning, and so B yes. So BYD's been doing solar panels and we've got, a, I think, more than two gigawatts of annual capacity in just solar. That's polycrystalline. It's silicon. polycrystalline. Yeah. There's some monocrystalline. We do a dual glass system with a Dow Corning seal that's oh. that's a very thin product. Oh. It has a it's the only panel I know today that is TUV certified for 40 years. So our approach is again to focus on the mass market applications. Yes, yes. And and we believe mm. if we help the utilities move to cleaner energy in scale, mm. then everyone's impacted by the grid. And if we help all of our utilities get cleaner energy then everyone that drives an electric vehicle is immediately adapting that energy because those are energy agnostic platforms so we look at helping the utilities convert to cheaper energy cleaner energy there's yeah. several there's several utilities in the US now that are buying three and a half cent solar plus storage PPAs power purchase agreements but we've seen a lot of buses in China with solar roof yes, yes. do you do that is yeah, it we, an option we actually did that and um, we launched the first bus that I brought across the U.S. to be tested had full solar panels covering the roof. Uh, the customers actually, when I say customers, you would be transit companies, uh, actually didn't like it. They have automated bus washing systems that didn't accommodate solar panels on the uh, roof. It was a little, there were, maybe they're a little too robust. Uh, and they had issues with, you know, they had to have it clean, they had to have it, and it would generate enough power and these yes. are polycrystalline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To offset the AC load yeah. on a hot summer day. Mm. But in city, it was shaded. When mm. we drove in downtown LA, most of the bus was in the shade as it drove along. You weren't getting the full solar, mm. um, full solar okay. radiance. It didn't make a lot so, of sense. So our customers mm. asked for that expense to be removed from the buses, and okay. we never launched. We had buses shipping in Shenzhen mm. that had solar on the roof for a time. That's it's completely capable. It's completely yeah, yeah, yeah. feasible. It's a yeah. And I, I would see a future where where we had off-grid transit centers in Africa that literally powered their own garage, yeah. stored the power in batteries, the buses would come pulling in and be charged. And we could build this entire system, a 10 bus system for $13 million. Yeah. Off grid, completely off grid, off power, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we see a future exactly where you're saying where self generation makes a lot of sense. Yeah, right. Off grid and, makes sense. And you can yes, do off grid yes. transit systems in Africa yes. today or, or Caribbean islands or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you we name see it. that as a major trend ourselves. Yeah, it is. Tell me about policy with models because um, BYD doesn't talk about it a lot, but as I understand it, you do forklifts. Uh, you, you, you're very broad with. You know, a lot of people talk the talk that electric vehicles yeah. are electric vehicles, but, but we've launched they them. don't actually go far beyond cars or cars and buses. Yeah. Some do. Toyota, yeah. of course, moves across. But um, what's, is forklift a dead market or a it's, lively market? Or? A forklift is a low-hanging fruit mm. because we see every continent needing distribution services, and they run 24 hours a day. So... And most of those are mixed, in-house, outdoor, but they're always in-house. And if you go in-house, you have to vent if you're running any internal coverage. Oh, yeah, usually Natural illegal. gas or yeah. diesel. It's, it's an Ill yeah. illegal for you to operate. Yeah. But electric is zero emissions. So, Absolutely. So we've, I think last year, the number was like 8,000 electric forklifts were shipped last are year. Are they lithium on? They were all iron phosphate based. All so lithium on? L all lithium iron so phosphate. Whereas the market in general with forklifts, I don't know what it is, for half a million a year, I can't remember the figure, but I, nearly all of that is actually lead acid, isn't it? So There's you're a, coming with something next generation. We're coming with something next generation. We see it actually as a, a lifetime battery commitment, right? Yeah. Lead acid is a great chemistry, but if you operate it 36 months, you know, Oh yeah, no, you're, you're pretty much replacing the entire lifetime. system. Whereas iron mm. phosphate, you have ten thousand cycles yeah. to seventy percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it yeah. is a heavier chemistry, but for ballasted operation like forklifts, 
They want more it's, battery. It's not heavy enough. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it, they actually are adding you cast need it. iron. There's a counterweight. You exactly. add cast iron, uh, so but it still makes sense. It makes brilliant sense. So it's lower cost of ownership lower cost if the forklift is lithium iron. Absolutely. However, maybe it's only a few percent of the world's forklifts every year are lithium iron. Why is that as an observer? Why aren't the others doing what you're doing? Um, well, I do see some. I see a lot of Japanese forklifts going lithium ion. Right. Uh, and that's great. Um, BYD has just entered the market two years ago. So to do six to 8,000 in the first year of production is really pride. I think we've shipped 400, 500 in the US now. So it's ramping. You will see it ramp really well. It will, it will disrupt. It would seem to us to make sense it because will, it's a cost. In that sort of industry, there's no romance. It's just hard money, and you, <laughs> it's hard if you, it's a lower cost of ownership, you can't afford yeah. not to do it. Right, and so, and know. we see it. We see it as, look, if if you're looking for job creation tools, mm. if you're a continent that doesn't have vast amounts of fuel reserves or mm. vast amounts of fuel refining or access, then every diesel bus, every diesel vehicle, every gasoline vehicle you buy or, or implement is hemorrhaging GDP. Mm. You're giving yeah, your yeah, money yeah. away to, the, to, to another continent. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, but when you electrify a platform, mm. it's always an electric job creation. Yep. Electricity is always locally generated with natural resources, yep. whether it's wind or solar, maybe it's hydro if you're blessed with, mm. with some of that potential, mm. but it's always local. Yeah, so, yeah. so it's, so, yeah that creates a reciprocal effect, an indirect okay, effect yes. of job creation because the platforms are energy agnostic. Okay, let's move across everything you said. Forklifts, okay. buses, cars. Um, Drayage vehicles. Tell us about fuel cells related to all of that because okay. I think the hard facts are that uh, with forklifts, um, a few thousand a year were done with fuel cells, but it's sort of stalled. And with cars, a number of car, uh, automotive companies have backed off from fuel cells. They have felt that uh, the hydrogen's not green, the product's not ready, the advantages are not necessarily there. Yeah. Certain other companies are very enthusiastic about them, as you know, Hyundai, Toyota. Um, but in the, so far, the hard facts are that the number of cars that are fuel cell cars is tiny, very, like yeah. fuel cell forklifts. Similarly with buses, similarly with trucks. Um, so across the patch, what is your attitude to fuel cell vehicles? So I, I've had a long experience with fuel cells and BYD is still committed to working with vendors that are trying to develop those. We've launched an initiative in Hawaii that will be a battery, a battery bus with a regenerative fuel cell generator to help do a range extension of that bus. And that's- yeah, Stop you there, is that a get you home emergency life belt or is it something that would be used on every trip? Um, it, it could be used on every trip. Okay, as long so as it a stays full functional. blown range extender. As, okay. as long as it stays functional. Yeah. Uh, I think that um, it has been tough for Toyota to launch fuel cell at a cost that, that isn't cost prohibitive. Um, you know, and they launched their leasing operations, they launched, but they, they themselves said it was a $130,000 vehicle. So commercializing a $130,000 consumer vehicle yep, yep. is a tough sell. Yep. And um, until you get that very complex system of pumps and stacks and specialized metals, materials, some rare earth metals, until you get that system really down in cost, mm. it can't compete with low cost batteries in what's a very mature technology and in motor technology. Indeed, indeed. And so that, that, the thing they're trying to solve is a great target, which is let's have a very fast refuel. They can refuel with a, you know, pumping that hydrogen, okay, okay. right? It's high energy density fuel. So they're trying to achieve that. What I see though is before they get commercialization of a vehicle that's less than $50,000, electric, buses, electric cars will charge in seven minutes. So if I was going to just force you before moving on, um, across the spectrum from an electric bike up to a light railway train, um, 
trucks and buses in between. Um, if I was going to urge you to tell me which one has the highest chance of succeeding with, for, with fuel cells, they might not become the majority, but at least they will get a, a beefy share and make money for someone. Which type of vehicle is most suited to fuel cells? So I would say long range, payload sensitive applications. So, so we're talking light rail and trucks long and range. coaches, long range coaches, gotcha. And in those applications, they are in high utilization. You have to have high utility. So that has to be in operation all the time to make the total cost of ownership worthwhile. Um, in those applications, I see potentially uh, you know, well, if it's rail, for example, making an investment in their own hydrogen generation stations at their own secure yeah. sites, right, where they yeah. already have railroad property secured because it's dangerous around railroads. So that's my biggest fear. When I've seen hydrogen fueled, uh, I've seen hydrogen fueled waste management vehicles go up in flames, and that's a that's a really intense fire it's it's a high energy density fuel but but it's an it's a hindenburg at the end of the day mm. if you don't have a safe system mm. so the safety becomes paramount and in san francisco they made a very mm. strong commitment to compress natural gas which is not anywhere close to as volatile as hydrogen but oh, true. but yeah. they had a leak okay one leak in their distribution system and shut their entire transit down system down for three days wow you don't remain at, at, yeah. at, at your job anymore yeah. if your transit system goes down for three days. Yeah. So, so liquid fuels that are difficult to dispatch to vehicles uh, and really inefficient, mm -hmm. natural gas is a poor example, but, but dangerous potentially to handle, those are tough ones to sell unless you have a really secure site. And yeah, I see railways. Yes, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. At yeah, some point. Yeah. I uh, I see it maybe for long haul trucks yeah. as a range extender. Yeah. Because if you're doing long haul and we don't have the infrastructure, even the AC infrastructure for fast charge, you'll have to have a way to go just that l extra okay. 100 miles to make your yeah, range. That's good. So um, so I do see it in payload sensitive and potentially potentially long range well, applications. Fascinating insights. Um, and one last question, in terms of the asked. cost of a vehicle, let's say your superb buses, um, the battery is a large part of the cost, um, but battery costs are coming down. Um, are they coming down faster than the cost of the vehicle? And if they are, what is taking that percentage? Because you have to add up to 100%. Yeah, I would say um, in China, uh, they've solved the problem. They mandated that all new bus purchases, all replacement buses will be zero emissions. And the only technology today that's commercially viable for zero emissions is, is an electric bus. Just to finish off, okay. uh, the, um, we were discussing how within the cost of one of your vehicles, bus, car, the battery is, is, you agree, likely to be a lesser proportion of the cost. Yes. What will be a greater proportion of cost inside the, the vehicle? So what will assume the higher role? So batteries are coming down at least 10% per year, uh, which means um, at some point they'll be less than 50% of the total subcomponent cost. Um, inverters always have been, especially big bi-directional inverters, have been uh, a big cost. In electric buses, the sub, it's, a, it's a large aluminum substructure. So the build out of all that aluminum and the manual operations to do a, a unibody construction really becomes the larger proportion of cost as battery gets lower. So labor cost become, assumes a bigger cost with so much custom mm. aluminum structure. So mm. in China, they have an advantage in cost because the labor is lower cost. In the United States, I have to pay a little more, mm. but the total cost of ownership is still, literally you get your bus paid off in California in two and a half years. Mm. But California is unique because they charge a carbon tax right. on every diesel bus. Right. It's approximately $75,000 a year. Yeah. And that carbon tax is placed into a, mm. a 
hybrid incentive or a low vehicle okay. incentive program. Yeah. And you can get $150,000 off the price of your bus. Yeah, for price okay, of your bus. Okay, so it's a special market. To try to adjust. Yeah, got you, got you. But got you. in a normal yeah. market, like yeah. Kansas City or yeah. Al these or Indianapolis, they will see those buses paid off in three to five years. Yep. Total cost of ownership yep. would save them in 12 years the entire cost of a replacement bus. So a, a 60 foot articulated bus that goes for $1.1 million will save in 12 years $1.1 million and enough saving to pay for it. Yeah. It's it's yeah. it's the perfect virtuous cycle. You're yeah. you're literally saving yeah. enough for your next replacement bus. And and you feel that um, a lot of the things being added to vehicles like vehicle to grid, vehicle to house and uh, vehicle all to the vehicle rest safety. Uh, is really customer driven they're asking it's, for all manner of well, extras tell me about bicycle right okay so so <laughs> so transit companies in the united states have seen a decline mm. in ridership mm. in order to counter that they want to make the bus more comfortable what they are able to do with an electric bus is they have a flat floor throughout very easy passenger friendly and it's quiet you can carry on a conversation now on an electric bus yep absolutely so now they're putting in-seat chargers, five volt, so just USB slots so you can charge your phone. They're adding Wi-Fi so it now becomes your mobile office. They'll have eight cameras, like Stanford mm. University is replacing their whole fleet. Mm. But it's free service and they have some vandalism problems. So they have outside bus cameras and inside bus cameras streaming video More things. to their knock center, right? So yeah. those attributes, which are considered high-tech attributes, yeah. align with the the whole image of an electric bus. Yeah. So transit company, companies are more apt to invest in high-tech gadgets. Indeed, yes, in, that's in, right. You talked about uh, Indianapolis has, I think, s four or six bike racks inside the 60-foot <laughs> bus. <laughs> that's so the, not high-tech. So the bicycle, well, it's not high-tech, <laughs> but it's catering to a different, yeah. it's a millennial it's market. The, yeah, right, right, absolutely, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. uh, you don't yeah. have 97-year-old guys yeah, getting on yeah, the bus with their bikes, yeah, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. so even though it's elderly friendly, yeah. You got six bike racks and you don't have yeah. to put it outside and get all snowy. Yeah. I'll load my bus inside the bus, you know? I remember at the, the at, uh, at a conference in uh, um, Oregon, I, yeah. I rode on a BYD bus and uh -huh. they, they said, this is a European version because each window has a hammer so you can <laughs> get out if it r rolls. But if it was American, you don't get to have the hammer. No, no hammers. Is that right? No hammers. <laughs> I love it. But they do have two portals on the roof. So I guess, no, they, I guess, uh, they, I guess they expect the bus to tip over and you can get out the side. But uh, yeah, in right. Europe, they have a crash yeah, hammer yeah. at every window. So you have to personalize what you're doing for so each customize region. what yeah. you're doing. Uh, it's wonderful. It's very exciting, very exciting company, obviously doing great things, moving very fast. And it's a great privilege to hear your opinions as to Thank how you. all the trends are going. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. I appreciate Thank your you. time. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.